Hi everyone, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Duncan, so I handed in my PhD three or four weeks ago now, so I thought um, with the seminar coming up I'd just take the chance to go back through the last four or five years or so and just talk about some of the experiences both uh, in uni and out of uni. Um, it's been nice to hear some of the people talk about their hobbies and um, I'll talk a little bit about how you fit that in. Obviously the first thing I did when I was coming to do this was write out a timeline of all the major events and then as soon as you start talking to people about them you get more and more stories that you remember and you're like, oh I need to fit that in, so it's now way too long. So this might be quite quick, but um, so I'm going to go right back to, to when I finished my undergrad and what my, my sort of hopes and dreams were back then. Uh, the early stages of the Redap project, uh, go through some of the different uh, experiences going to conference and other travels that I did while I've been here doing my PhD. Um, a little bit about the day-to-day -day running of the Redap project that my PhD was part of. Um, a little bit about the album that I made with my band, which took up a huge amount of my life as well. Um, how you do a write-up and relating that to the Shawshank Redemption. Um, a quick bit about my thesis and then what I'm doing now and what I'm going to do in the future. So this is the aforementioned timeline of all the major things that I could uh, think of from uh, right back at my MN through uh, my initial supervisor right through to what I'm doing now. Um, so starting at the very beginning, uh, my undergraduate was at the University of Strathclyde. I studied mechanical engineering with aeronautics. Um, for the last couple of years, I also worked as an sort of intern engineer for Jacobs, who are a large engineering consultancy. And essentially, I hated it. It was probably the worst job I've ever had. Um, mostly, I mean, the, the work was, was quite interesting. It was all to do with um, nuclear submarine decommissioning. Um, but the office was just the deadest place that I'd ever experienced. And I hadn't loved my uh, undergraduate course either, so I kind of got to the end and I didn't want to just fall through the uh, educational system of school, uni, into a vocational job. So I wanted to take some time and think about what made me happy and what I wanted to do. So what I actually set myself a goal of was music's what makes me happy. I've done music since the age of seven when my parents shoved me into a cathedral choir. Um, went to music school and that was what I wanted to base my life around. So that was actually my goal when I finished my undergraduate course. I said, three years, see how far you can take it. Um, I do always hesitate to bring this up in a work context because this is always what people think of when you start <laughs> telling people you're in a band. They get this uh, image of you in your parents' garage with long hair um, looking a bit unwashed. Um, hopefully it wasn't like that. It was a bit more professional. We had more of a, a plan. So... Um, Obviously, uh, just saying you're going to do music doesn't pay the bills, so I was looking for something to do alongside that, and I found this quite nice, nice quote on um, how to balance your life at this stage. And I was looking for, for a job that, um, obviously, when you come out of a mechanical engineering degree, your main choices are oil and gas or make weapons for the military, and neither of those things particularly appealed to me. Um, so looking for something to do, I spent six months signing on at Parkhead Job Centre, which if any of you know, um, that area of Glasgow is very grim. Uh, and eventually I was very lucky to, that this PhD came up randomly in the uh, March time. Uh, so I went for an interview along with one other guy who happened to be on my same course at Strathclyde, so it was quite weird, uh, and got the, got the PhD, so that was great. Um, it was in renewable energy, which was something I'd done a little bit of as part of my undergraduate. Um, I'd looked at comparing weights of tidal turbines for my master's project, and it was something that didn't involve making big guns. Uh, but true to my plan, I then immediately went off uh, like the day I started and went and recorded an EP for two weeks with my band. Um, I'm going to come back to some more band stuff later on, so I'll quickly skip through this and get on to uh, the early days of my PhD and the Redap project. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, the Redap project uh, stands for Reliable Data Acquisition Platform for Tidal. Uh, and it's a project funded by the Energy Technologies Institute. And the whole project was based around this one megawatt tidal turbine, which was made by a company that's now Alstom. And the project was looking at the effects of the environment on that turbine long term, and also the effects of the turbine on the environment around it. So various uh, people involved, including ourselves. So our job was to do site characterization, i.e. measure the flow coming into the turbine. We had people doing modeling work. There were people um, looking at biofouling, and there's obviously the guys operating the, operating the turbine as well. Um, so it was quite an interesting project early on. Um, this was my original thesis title, so spatially and temporally correlated tidal flow turbulence and its likely impact on tidal current energy extraction. So if you read a little bit into that, what it's saying is work out how to measure the flow, work out how it varies absolutely everywhere, and then work out how it affects a tidal turbine, i.e. the entire field, solve it in one PhD. So that was um, 
quite intimidating from the start. And this was a bit of a common problem early on in Redact is um, too many things were being offered in a kind of moon, get the moon on a stick kind of fashion, um, which did lead one Ari early on to famously say that he wouldn't touch the project with a barge pole. Um, and one of the main takeaway messages from that early on is that um, the way we approach an ETI project can't be the same as the way you approach an EPSRC project in that there's a little bit more room for movement with an EPSRC for you to say, um, give me some money to investigate this area. It will likely have these impacts. You go away and you do some good science and it's all great. ETI, if you do that and the good science isn't exactly to the letter what you said you'd do in your contract, then you don't get paid for it and it's not worth anything. So you have to be just a little bit more careful about how you specify things. And that probably relates to other um, more industrial style funding as opposed to more sort of open funding. So that's just something to keep in mind from uh, some of the early lessons. And particularly one of the things that kept coming back was in the contract we had this third generation parametric model that no one knew what it was, uh, what the parameters were, what the model was going to look like and we were contractually obliged to um, supply it. Um, and I think early on one of the other problems was that uh, myself and Brian who comprised the uh, team had very little tidal experience. Brian had done two uh, RA projects on floating wave sensors, um, so it was very good but not tidal, and I'd just come out of my undergrad, so I was hugely inexperienced. And there was, um, this was also on the back of the Periwatt project, which has had some angst associated with it, and there was a lot of tension in the team early on, I would say, and uh, there was a lot of <coughs> pressure on us to get up to speed very, very quickly. Um, Otherwise, basically, the project was going to be taken off us and someone else would take the responsibility on board. Um, and the only way to get around that is to learn really, really quickly, basically. Make sure you earn people's respect, while at the same time, you can't be super defensive. You need to make sure they're still involved in all your conversations and that you're planning together. And that was a, it was a really interesting experience because it went from being quite, not adversarial, but it was definitely competitive early on. And there was a sort of phase early on where we really turned it around and actually got everyone working as a team and going in the right direction. And I definitely say that Brian deserves a lot of credit for, for how that turned around. Um, so actually onto what we were meant to be doing. So uh, this whole time we were designing sensor platforms for measuring the flow into the turbine. Um, the Alstom had designed this whole new one megawatt turbine, but it was ended up being delayed by I think 18 months, which is quite a lot in a, what was originally a three year project. Uh, so what we did was we um, agreed with the sensor, the um, uh, turbine manufacturer that we would put some sensors on their pre-existing turbine. So we had all these great plans for the one megawatt. Brian's got tons of unbelievably complicated drawings about how the interfaces work. And then essentially we got up to Orkney and uh, some guy welded us on some stainless steel platforms and we bolted them in and just got going. So it wasn't quite that simple, but in terms of the, the communication side of it was still pretty tricky, but it was quite a funny sort of change. Um, I'm going to talk quickly about some different uh, conference experiences that um, go right through my PhD and I'll come back to the sort of day-to-day -day runnings of PhD stuff later on. Um, so one of the other first things I did once I'd um, come in, started, gone off and recorded an EP and come back and done some reading was I, I went off to UTEC which was in Southampton in 2011 and I really didn't know anyone there. I remember um, coming down to breakfast on the first morning and seeing some Edinburgh people and I sat and chat to them and they didn't actually know I was from Edinburgh. So it was all a little bit awkward and it was pretty intimidating uh, going and watching some very high powered CFD presentations when you had no idea what was going on. So yeah, I find that quite difficult. And it, I think in the, the original idea was just to go and get a feel for the area. It was probably a little bit more intimidating than I thought it was gonna be. And I'll come back to how I kind of got around that later on. Um, my first conference where I actually spoke was a thing called European Conference on Underwater Acoustics, which was held at Harriet Watt. Um, so one, one morning um, as I was going through Sight Hill on the bus, uh, my colleague Samuel Harding, who used to be here, was at a conference in Rio, and I was going through Facebook on my phone, and there were photos of him paragliding off the, uh, the cliffs of Rio while I was going through Sight Hill, and I thought, I'm definitely not at the right conference here. Um, <laughs> but it was really good to get a, an early, that was quite a nice relaxed conference, and getting a good early talk in definitely helps sort of settle you down for... Um, things later on. I want to do a brief uh, sales pitch for INOR, uh, which is the International Network of Offshore Renewable <laughs> Energy. So I've been to three of these now. They're every year in about May. I went to one in Wales, one in Spain, which Adrian here organised, and one in Italy. And 
So it's all about young networkers coming together um, to talk about uh, offshore renewable energy and where they are in their career. And you can be very, very open. And this was one of the things that for me really started to open up a network of people within this field that I could, I could talk to and interact with because you don't need to be worried about admitting that you don't know what's going on. Everyone's being very, very open. It's l lovely people, great settings, and it's great fun. And more to the point, when I went to subsequent conferences, you see people that you already know. They'll introduce you to other people. It's such a great foot in the door for actually getting your um, network in this field going. And it's such a contrast to you know, that early conference where I was you know, totally scared of what was going on around me. Uh, and that's one of the things that's really helped me. So I definitely encourage you all um, to try and get along to those at some point. I'm sure there's other people in the room that will attest to how good they are. Um, a couple of other conference stories. Uh, once at UTEC, someone asked me what an Ekman Spire was, and I said I didn't know, and the room just fell into stony silence, so that was quite funny. But the point being that it is okay to not know things sometimes. Um, another favourite story was Jeff very unfortunately got the graveyard session on the final half-day morning at IcoE, and everyone was very, very tired, mostly very hungover, and he started his talk with, I know everyone's struggling here, but don't worry, we're going to get through this together, and then launched into a talk about bearings on the Oyster device. So that was quite entertaining. Um, just a few other quick travel stories. Um, so I was, had this trip to, to America quite early on. Um, EMREC stands for Marine Renewable Energy Conference, and that's held in uh, New England. I think that's something that's still going. We had some sort of existing connections with it, and myself and Robin were going to go over, but it was a two-day conference, and I thought two days to go to America seems a bit pointless. I'll go a week either side, and I had a friend in Boston, and we were going to go around and play some music and, and have some fun and a bit of a holiday. And then this happened. Um, so this is Hurricane Sandy, which landed and not exaggerating, bang on the day of the conference, uh, and pretty much bang on where the conference was going to be, which was in Providence uh, in Rhode Island. So I got an email from Robin like two days before when I was sitting in a house in Boston saying, don't travel. I was like, oh, it's a bit late for that. Um, <laughs> um, so we were, I was actually far enough north in Boston that it, it just looked like a bad gale when you opened the front door but when we, uh, me and my friend Hannah were actually working our way down to New York and it, it was pretty bad, some of the damage and there was, the power was out and when we got to New York um, the subways were still flooded and the, the tunnels were closed and stuff and actually the last day we were in New York was um, we were playing a, a gig in Harlem in this place called The Shrine and it was the the Obama had been elected for his second term, uh, and it's fair to say Harlem was a pretty pro-Obama part of the world. And this one guy went, so the news was announced at like midnight or one in the morning or something, and this one guy literally ran at the door, did a knee slide across the floor, and just went, woo! And it was just, it was pretty crazy. So that, <laughs> that's the first of my travel stories. Oh yeah, this Independence Day shot is actually what the hurricane looked like when it hit New York. It's, yeah, it was pretty, pretty scary. Um, uh, another classic story was um, I came into the office one day and the guy said, uh, oh, David's been looking for you. He wants you to take some visitors up to Orkney to show them some renewable energy stuff. So I uh, got on my high horse and I was like, I don't have time for this. I'm too busy. And I marched up to see him and then came back 15 minutes later and said, go to Orkney. <laughs> and I think Brian was at the back of the room saying, you sure showed him? Um, so actually, though, it was, I'm being slightly exaggerating for, for humour, but it was, a, it was a very good trip in the end. And the... Um, Really a cruise site where the full scale wave site is, is actually beautiful. There's this like huge cliff face, um, and obviously all of the fetch distance up until you hit Greenland. So you get these huge waves, and those cliffs are actually really, really high. You can't really see it in that shot. So we did, we saw some tidal turbines, went out to see Palamas, which is just off the coast here. And I also got a trip to Taiwan and Japan out of it, so, which I'm going to talk about now. And I also got to meet my supervisor's ex wife uh, in a very awkward circumstances. So, um, <laughs> As part of this trip, I took um, these Japanese visitors, so it was Dr. Nobuhito Mori, if anyone of, any of you know him, and two of his master students, and we went around Scarborough, which is like this old Stonehenge, stone aged village, sorry. And it was like November, so nobody would, goes on holiday to Orkney in November because it gets dark about three in the afternoon. And so this woman just said, oh, there's no one here, I'll just show you around. She showed us around, and at the end she said, why are you here? And we said, oh, we're here, we're looking at wave and tidal energy, and I'm at the University of Edinburgh. And she said, oh, you know my ex-husband then? I was like, oh, what's his name? She said, Ian Bryden. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and then there was just this awkward silence, and then we ran away. Um, so I, I actually, the EPE net is the trip to Taiwan and uh, Japan. So the reason they, uh, the Japanese guys were coming here was part of this project. So this is the 
European Pacific Energy Network. Uh, so we went out there for, I think, 10 days, five days in Taiwan and five days in Japan. I actually did a whole seminar on this when I got back because there's so many good pictures. Most of these are courtesy of Jonathan Shek. I don't even know if he's here today. Um, but this is, so this is us. Um, uh, me, Shekers, Abby there, and then uh, Robin and Ian in the background is uh, David and Tom as well. More eagle-eyed of you will notice that for some reason I'm not drinking beer, and this is because I got the most horrendous food poisoning. Um, pretty much got salmonella the day before I was going to leave, so I spent the entire flight, which is quite a long flight, basically rocking back and forward in the fetal position with horrible stomach cramps. And this is basically the first time I spent any time with Abby, who must have thought I was a very strange person. Um, but after I got over that slowly, it was probably the longest period I've ever gone without having alcohol because I was just so dehydrated I couldn't ever drink. Um, so I've got some pretty pictures because the, uh, we were there in February, which is Chinese New Year, and Taipei had the most amazing uh, New Year spectacle I've ever seen. So it's two massive open squares just filled with lanterns, so basically different coloured semi-see-through fabrics with um, fairy lights in them. And it was just went on for as far as you can see, and it was just huge. And I wish I could go through all these photos again, but I picked out the what we decided was a tidal turbine and the Buddha, and there's some pictures of us enjoying it. So I actually find that I still have all these on the end drive, which I'm sure I'm not meant to have. Um, so I will download them, but if anyone wants to see any more pretty pictures at some point, do let me know. We also did some work. Uh, so this is uh, Robin and Tom doing a sort of brainstorming session for the big challenges um, facing energy in the world. So this was a joint chemistry and engineering things, so we covered quite a lot of topics. Robinson very suspiciously at that, so it's probably one of my suggestions. Um, just a couple of uh, pretty shots of Japan. So we, we were in Kyoto in Japan, and Taipei and Shinzu in, Taipei, in Taiwan. Uh, this is the Golden Temple in Kyoto, and this is the world's largest Buddha that me and Abby went to see in the next town in, in Nara. But the main point in all of this is that um, we have tons of great connections all around the world, and if you really want to go away and have those experiences, talk to your supervisor, they'll know who knows who in the world. And I know that uh, Monica and Paul are away in China at the moment, and you know, if that's an experience you want, it can probably happen. Right, back to the day job. Um, so this is the glorious one megawatt turbine, and I've superimposed on the timeline uh, all the t different deployments. And the first thing you'll notice is that it was in and out of the water quite a lot. So um, what did that two years of uh, Redap project look like? Well, firstly, what did the one megawatt turbine look like? It looks like this. Um, this is classic Orkney. Probably 10 minutes later, it was snowing sideways. Um, so, yep, yeah, uh, this is the one megawatt turbine being deployed. I won't go into details about the actual turbine, but basically it's uh, neutrally buoyant, so you can put it in the water and you can tow it uh, without having to pay for a massively expensive vessel. Here's some of our Edinburgh kit for putting our flow sensors on. We have one sensor in the nose uh, here at the front end, and then we've got this top frame and we've got a rear frame as well, and basically the turbine can yaw, so we can point these sensors in different directions. Um, I'm going to give a quick day-to-day -day rundown, but kind of a month-to-month -month rundown of how this project actually worked over this period. Excuse me. So we're on site, and we're trying to prepare for deployment. We've got our equipment. We're putting it on the, the frames. We're connecting up. We're testing it. Um, we then put it on the turbine. You do all the connections again. You do your troubleshooting, and eventually... Um, a crane comes and hangs over you and the people are shouting at Brian to stop trying to fix that fuse box because they need to deploy the turbine. Um, then you'd get back uh, once it had been deployed to Edinburgh and you'd be like, Phew, that was a hard week. And then you log into the turbine and you see what's working. Generally about half the sensors would turn on and you'd then spend the next few days trying to troubleshoot the rest while you got up to, you know, nine-tenths of the sensors working. And then the next question you'd ask is what is actually giving good data? So we had a couple of uh, instances where, uh, for example, one time the, the corner frame had been caught by one of the tow ropes and been bent and one of the sensors was actually just pointing at a metal bar um, so that wasn't giving very good data. We had some other problems with, with grounding and stuff in different places because obviously there's other, other machinery going on on the turbine. Uh, so once you've worked out what your good sensor set is, you're then working out what data you need to collect, what's priority one, what needs the most sensors because essentially if you leave stuff under the water in a corrosive environment in four meters per second flow on top of an operating turbine, stuff breaks quite quickly. Um, and then as you start to collect that data and instruments go down, you work out your priorities two through N, and that's always changing all the time. You know, you have to be very, very adaptive in those kind of situations. And then eventually so you'd get a phone call saying the turbines, something's wrong, we need to pull it out. Uh, it's coming out in two weeks, then you've got four weeks, and then it goes back in. So you then immediately have to go into 
what was causing problem A? How do we think it's been broken? How can we probably fix it? And you go into the kind of procurement phase of trying to get all the equipment you need, and sometimes that involves liaising with the sensor manufacturers. So essentially the main point of this is when you start putting things into the sea, you need to be very adaptive and it's very fluid. And somehow in here, you've got to find time to do analysis for your thesis. So um, great to be involved in a PhD where you get how many hundred thousand pounds worth of kit and you're on a real commercial scale turbine, you're really at sea, but it was very stop start and it was very hard to sort of get any analysis going. So those are the pros and cons of that. And this whole time, obviously you're having to um, work within a team. I think it's fair to say that uh, me and Brian took a, a little bit of time to get going together in terms of we approach things very differently, but now I think we're um, a really good stage. Uh, Brian had to be a little bit patient as when I haven't had my beauty sleep and it's raining sideways on an Orkney dockside, I get a little bit grumpy. Um, and obviously we're also trying to work with a, a wider team in terms of the people on site. You have to be, I mean, you're basically on their turf, so you have to be very nice to them and uh, use their time very efficiently. And you're also still trying to liaise with all the other people in the project who need data for modeling and you're trying to get them what they need. So there was a lot of complex things going on. Um, just a few stories from the one megawatt days. So obviously there was only ever meant to be one deployment of the one megawatt turbine. We turned into seven plus the 500 kilowatt deployment before that. Uh, there was a time we needed to get an ADCP battery, which we were quoted at about two and a half grand, I think, shipping to send it from uh, Norway to Orkney. So that's basically two and a half grand for a first class stamp. Uh, we said that wasn't acceptable, so our closest option was to fly it to Edinburgh Airport for a grand. And I went and picked it up in a car and drove it up to Orkney, which is an eight, mi eight hour drive if you include the ferry. Um, one time we needed to go up on a week's notice in the middle of the St. Magnus Festival, which is a big classical arts festival in Orkney, so there was no hotels available. Essentially, our travel agent phoned one and it wasn't available, so then gave up. Uh, so I ended up phoning Visit Scotland, who will actually phone round hotels for you and then ring you back and say, do you want this? Uh, but I slightly miscommunicated our intentions and me and Brian almost had to share a double bed. And <laughs> I think you ended up sleeping in a broom closet or something. It was quite weird. Um, <laughs> uh, some classics, don't rewire late at night when you've had no sleep because you'll, you'll break stuff. Uh, do make sure you've got the right cable before midnight on the last day because when you've worked a 17 hour shift, the last thing you want to do is go and try and plug in the cable and just be like. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was a, a pretty depressing evening. Um, it wasn't actually our fault. The people who'd had the sensor before us sent us the wrong cable. Um, Putting things under the sea is hard, that's like the main takeaway lesson from this. If you're going to put stuff under the sea, it is very, very difficult. You want to make sure you've got pretty much backup to your backups and you've got, yeah, lots of redundancy in the system is a good idea. The team, very quickly, basically just an excuse to show off this picture that Samuel uh, Harding on the left there made as a, a go goodbye present. Um, also some honourable, so we've got myself and Brian who are on it basically all the time. Uh, Greg and Sam worked a sort of in, in little spurts, um, making some various components. We also had Lubo very early on, who was one of Brian's uh, MN students, who was great, he was super enthusiastic. Um, we had Justine and Stephanie both come over from Canada, and we've now got Thibaut on the team as well. So we've actually been quite a lot of people involved in this project over the time. Um, I'm gonna talk about music now. Um, I have no idea how I'm doing for time, but so over the past however many years since I started my PhD, we've been kind of chipping away at um, uh, my band Turning Plates, which is my main sort of out of work hobby. Um, we'd done one very successful thing at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe that, that had been good, uh, but we were obviously getting to the end of my three-year plan uh, where I had to see if I was going to become a, a rock star. And um, what we decided was that we, we would try and make an album and in order to finance that we would put in an application to Creative Scotland. And if we got that application that would be good money, we could make something good and that would be a good step in the right direction. So it's actually uh, very similar to applying for any kind of academic funding. You basically, you start writing some stuff, come up with an idea, you write to get down your proposal, you say why it's gonna have impact in all sorts of crazy ways, how, it, how it's gonna be inclusive to the Scottish people. Um, and then you put in your application, you get feedback, and then you put it in again, and eventually, hopefully, you get some money. So we actually got seven and a half grand to make an album. Um, it turns out it costs a lot more than that. In fact, in the end of the day, it cost exactly what our original budget cost before they made us make it lower. Um, but yeah, so you go through that, you bid, and then you've got, got your money, so you've got the project management of what do you do when, when are you recording, who's available when, when can you get extra people in, are you gonna outsource your PR and marketing, how much is that gonna cost, you need to organize an album launch, and then at the end of it, at the end of it all, you need to uh, give feedback back to Creative Scotland. So in, it, in a lot of ways, it's very similar to 
EPS or Seatster. So I've just got a few sexy pictures of us in Chem19 Studios in Hamilton, which is a glorious part of the world. Um, there's me and our producer Jamie looking slightly concerned. Uh, there's our drummer trying to look as rock and roll as possible, which I think he does quite well. Uh, this is us, you can't really see this, but this is us sitting mood lighting for one of our uh, intimate mixing sessions. And here's us the day we got some extra trombones in, which was quite good fun. Uh, and this guy had his uh, kid with him, so we had to babysit the entire time. So it was quite good. Um, so in the end, it, it all turned out reasonably well. We got a nice uh, write-up in the Sunday Herald about the album. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the challenges of working in a, in a band, I guess. So you've got project planning, which everyone has to deal with. But um, some of the unique challenges are team working within a, an artistic context is very, very tricky because you can't just, if you have a disagreement, it's not like an engineering problem where you can write out all the pros and cons and start scoring stuff. If someone just doesn't like a harmony or they don't like a melody, you can't really score it. Uh, the emotional stakes are always ridiculously high and you're stuck in a room with these people who are all emotionally straught for a long period of time. It gets uh, pretty cabin fevery. Uh, the economics are terrible and I'm still paying for this album now. Um, and I'm going to come back and talk about life balance a little bit at the end. But fatigue was definitely uh, a massive issue. I've ne never been someone who can sleep during the day, but when I came back from this and I was trying to, every time I had a couple of days off and I was trying to fit in some PhD, I just would fall asleep in the middle of the day because it was just absolutely emotionally exhausting, even though you're just sitting on your bum watching someone play on a computer most of the day. And then there's the interesting question of was it a success? It certainly wasn't economically a success, but it's very difficult to judge whether artistically things are a success. Um, so I'm going to go back into PhD land, um, almost done, hopefully finished just about on time. Um, so obviously writing up PhD is like being in a prison, we're just taking that for granted. Um, but why I thought it was interesting to compare it to the Shawshank Redemption is because there's this lovely scene in the Shawshank Redemption where um, they're t discussing the value of hope essentially. And from speaking to other people who've written up PhDs, that seems to be two, two strains of thought. You can either pick something that you look forward to with all your heart and you use that to just drive you through. But for me, I just needed to just tell myself there was no hope and just be like, there's nothing else. There's, there's only PhD forever. And just like go into a little box. And it got to the point where I actually have dreams about the MATLAB problem that I was trying to solve, it, the same problem in my dream. Um, and that was the thing that got me through it. But the main point is that everyone's different and the way everyone gets through these things is um, going to be different. So you've got to find your own individual way. Um, and very quickly, this is what the um, uh, title of my thesis ended up being. So assessment of mid-depth arrays of single beam acoustic Doppler velocity sensors to characterize tidal energy sites rolls off the tongue. And uh, so going back to the original title, basically we narrowed it down to how do you measure turbulence and cut out all the, the other associated stuff as future work. Um, quick reason on why you might want to do that. So obviously you get a lot of different things that make the water flow fluctuate in a tidal channel. You've got shear profiles, you've got turbulent structures and you've got waves. And um, what you need to do is try and measure them. So you need to parameterize them. So these are some of the metrics that we would use. Um, flying through this, so if you're actually interested in the detail, come speak to me or Brian. Um, but to keep this simple, what happens when you superimpose them? The normal way you measure it is with something called an acoustic Doppler current profiler. You send uh, three or four beams up into the ocean. You measure the Doppler shift in the sound of the beam, and that gives you the idea of the velocity in that beam direction. And then you resolve that into your streamwise, transverse, and vertical components. But obviously, in order to do that, you're, if you're measuring here and here, and assuming the velocity measurement is here, you're measuring over a very large area um, when you've got a big range of fluctuations going on. So that might not, ser not necessarily be representative. Whereas if you have a single beam instrument that's just pointing into here, you're measuring a much smaller area. So you don't have this problem of spatial averaging, and you don't have to do this velocity transform. So that gives you some advantages in terms of um, how you measure turbulence. So I showed this at the IES seminar. This is basically the simplification of what my thesis is. It's a street fighter fight between these two instruments. Uh, turns out this has some advantages in some situations, and this is better for others, as you would probably expect. Uh, just a quick t uh, chat on where we were. So this is where the tidal site is. Uh, this is where the cliffs I showed earlier on are from the, the Billy Apu wave site. And uh, this is the, the actual tidal channel of Fall of Warness. So that's us there. So you can see this nice straight sort of channel there where the flow gets accelerated through. Uh, if you're interested in the actual outcomes of my thesis, you can come chat to me. But this is the basic chapter structure, lit review, overview of the readout project. Um, took a look at the noise in individual sensors, 
took a look at how they were interfering between each other because obviously there's acoustic pulses going everywhere uh, and then basically the two-part analysis of which was better. So I'm just going to fly through what I've been doing since, well, dovetailing with the end of my PhD. So I got um, some money to from uh, the IA, the Impact Accelerator account, uh, which is EPSRC fund, to work with Nortec and Flowwave to do some characterization of the turbulence in the tank up there, working with uh, Donald, who's here somewhere. And uh, that's been great. We've uh, taken all our measurements and we've uh, halfway sort of through and out anal analyzing it and hoping to get that written up into a paper in the not too distant future. Um, but if anyone's interested in that, um, you can come chat to me or Donald. Um, I'm now working with Tom Bruce. I've taken over um, Stephanie Ordinez's project, known as Steph Med or X Steph or now Dunk Med. Um, basically working with XT University, looking at these uh, cross flow turbines uh, and doing testing of different array layouts to see what the optimum power output is. So we're going to be testing there in Flowwave in December. Um, is that the end? This is a little Star Trek reference for those of you who like that kind of thing. So it's the undiscovered country, which is a metaphor for the future. Um, just some final thoughts on, on my PhD. Uh, Joe was asking me earlier if it was positive. I think, I mean, it's difficult, but it's great. I mean, the kind of people that end up doing a PhD almost certainly like, like a bit of a challenge and it's good to be doing something where uh, you feel you're in the right field. I think the main things for me was um, comparing my, what I do now to that job that I had at Jacobs. I just love the, the people here at IES. It's been such a big part of um, why I've enjoyed it. You're obviously learning every day in a PhD. I know that you're not quite your own boss, but you do have a lot of freedom to, to choose what you want to do. Um, there's a lot of uh, difficult times as well, um, particularly when we were going through that period of trying to get data. And you, I was thinking every time I came up with an idea for what I want to analyze, we wouldn't get that data. And I was like, what do I do now? And also during the write-up, it's very easy to get to the point where you're like, no one's ever going to care about this. Um, and I did get to the end of one chapter and just thought, this is just really boring. Um, <laughs> but I think the main key is just to not get isolated. And it is really easy to just tunnel in and do your own thing. And you need to, uh, whoever it is, if it's your supervisor, if it's somebody else who's in a similar field, just get someone that you talk to regularly about where your PhD is at and help, helps you keep some perspective. Um, a few thoughts on life balance, particularly as someone who's worked very, very hard to try and keep music almost as a full-time job alongside a PhD. Uh, basically, you can't do that, and you end up exhausted all the time. So it's not, and that's not a good thing, because then everything suffers. Um, so there's some, uh, so this isn't meant to be patronized as well, but this is just some things that I kind of try and tell myself. So it's very easy to get into that, my stuff's too important attitude. I don't have time for this, that, and the other thing. Most of the time that this, that, and the other thing is spending time with friends or like eating properly or getting sleep and the stuff that you need to generally be happy and healthy in life. Um, so don't get into that attitude. And it is unbelievably easy to do because one of the ways you get through stuff is by building up a bit of adrenaline. You get yourself flustered and that's when you need to sort of find that balance. Um, I've had a good dose of failures recently, particularly in, uh, I took a, a singing exam that I failed on my sight singing, which I was absolutely furious about. Um, but it's just very, very hard to, if you're, I mean, we're all people who, we have passions out with work, and we're all people who want to push things really hard. In order to find out where the absolute maximum of that ability is, you need to find the limit, and the only way to find the limit is by going <laughs> beyond it and failing every now and again. So um, that's at least what I try to tell myself, um, and you can always keep working at it. Um, don't feel compelled to work 50 hours a week um, until you're writing up anyway then you probably do need to feel compelled to work 50 hours a week um, and the one the big thing that I wish I'd done more of early on is um, if you're trying to plan hectic work schedule and hectic hobbies all at the same time you need to actually start scheduling in things like seeing your friends when you relax when you're actually going to do your washing so when your diary is actually fill up the next two months and you haven't got any time off in there you probably need to have a little bit of a relook at that um, yeah, don't forget to live your life. And I'm going to finish with a quote from one of my heroes, Leonard Bernstein, which I think sums up the PhD experience. And I'm only four minutes over. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.